Ecology of Everyday Life, Rethinking the Desire for Nature, by Kaya Heller, published by Black Rose Books, 1999. Chapter 2 Reflections on the Eco-Feminist Desire for Nature During the past several decades, strands of ecological theory have emerged reflecting diverse expressions of the desire for ecological integrity. By tracing the development of specific ecological discussions within a wider ecology movement, we may gain an appreciation for the challenges and possibilities that arise as particular groups begin to explore the connections between social and ecological justice. As noted in the previous chapter, the desire for ecological integrity can be marked by moments of individualism, abstraction, and romanticism that can be traced back to ecology's European origins. Yet as this chapter illustrates, Ecological activists may also express this desire in more social and political terms, linking problems of ecological degradation to questions of hierarchy and oppression within society. In such cases, the desire for nature, or the desire for a quality of everyday life that is healthful, meaningful, and ecological, is framed as a need to overcome social as well as ecological injustice. Using ecofeminism as a case study this chapter examines the process by which different groups approach ecological issues from a more social, rather than individualistic or romantic perspective, recasting questions of nature in terms that reflect their own identities and situations. It is through exploring the connections between ecology and social justice that ecofeminists ground their desire for ecological integrity in concrete social and ecological realities of everyday life. In so doing, Ecofeminism is largely able to articulate a social desire for nature, transcending many of the limitations that mark the wider radical ecology movement as a whole. Yet the history of ecofeminism has not been without hurdles. Emerging from a variety of different ecological and feminist tendencies, ecofeminists have often struggled, particularly in the early years, with questions such as how to avoid the tendency to invoke universal notions of gender, nature, and culture or how to fit into a wider multicultural feminist movement. This chapter explores a few of the primary trajectories by which ecofeminism originally unfolded in the 1980s. These originating influences, radical feminism, social ecology environmental justice and international environmental movements, reflect only several of the many movements that informed the development of contemporary ecofeminism. Yet by studying these tendencies, we may gain a general appreciation for the wider context in which women were beginning to approach the question of ecology in the 1980s, providing insight into the problems and possibilities that emerge as groups link questions of nature to issues of social, cultural, and political justice. Radical Feminism and the Emergence of the Body Politic Within the radical feminism of the late 60s and early 70s, an organic sensibility began to germinate eventually finding its expression within many eco-feminist writings today. This organic sensibility emerged within an exploration of the embodied personal that found its first seeds within the context of the new left. Since the late 1960s, the body has become a touchstone to which many feminists return in order to measure the groundedness of feminist theory. The body politic, developed by radical feminists, attempted to render feminist theory resonant with women's lived experience as flesh and blood in the world, providing a palpable praxis that corresponded with women's bodily reality. Ecological politics has also played a role in grounding feminist politics. Ecology like the body offers feminism an organic dimension by which to explore women's survival not as abstract sisters in patriarchy, but as women addressing the concrete and visceral dimensions of social and ecological injustice. And as we shall see, radical feminist body politics contains a latent ecological sensibility that, in turn, gives way to what would soon be called ecofeminism. In the late 60s and early 70s, thousands of women were involved in political organizations such as Students for a Democratic Society and the anti-war and civil rights movements. While participating in these struggles, Many women brought to light glaring contradictions between the abstract principles and goals of political movements and their own personal, embodied experiences as women in the world. While men spoke of goals of liberty freedom, and equality for humanity, movement women were often cloistered in the kitchen doing the mailings and making coffee for movement men. <laughs>
When women attempted to focus on their own liberation, they were often advised to wait for the greater liberation of humanity at which time women's liberation would inevitably follow. The women of the New Left soon grew tired of waiting. They began to recognize the contradictions between their own private, embodied struggles and the public, political ideals of larger struggles for social justice. Standing together in kitchens, or while licking envelopes, women began to engage in informal discussions regarding contradictions such as the irony of fighting against U.S. aggression in Vietnam during the day while often being abused physically at night by the same men who opposed the war. In a speech given at a citywide meeting of radical women's groups in New York City in 1968, Annie Code expressed women's dissatisfaction with leftist movements. Quote, Within the last year many radical women's groups have sprung up throughout the country. This was caused by the fact that movement women found themselves playing secondary roles on every level, be it in terms of leadership, or simply in terms of being listened to. They found themselves afraid to speak up because of self-doubts when in the presence of men. They ended up concentrating on food making, typing, mimeographing, general assistance work, and serving as a sexual supply for their male comrades after hours. End quote. Note. Ancode, Women in the Radical Movement, in Radical Feminism, EDS Ancode, Ellen Levine and Anita Rapone, New York, New York Times Books Co., 1973, page 318. End note. Women from all over the country formed groups where they could discuss their experiences in the movement and talk about the embodied details of their everyday lives. Some of these groups emerged into formal consciousness-raising groups in which women began to see that insights and experiences once thought of as idiosyncratic or purely personal were shared by many others as well. Soon, like astronomers linking a seemingly random scattering of stars into a constellation, women began to link disparate personal experiences into a constellation of oppressions, which they referred to as patriarchy, that was highly political and historical in nature. Issues such as sexuality relationships, health, work, family, and violence in the home and street, all once seen as women's personal bodily issues not to be considered or discussed in public, now were examined and understood through a distinctly political lens. Out of this analysis was born a body politic, an attempt to understand the political implications of women's experience of male domination in their everyday lives. From this analysis came a radical feminist movement that created counter-institutions to address the bodily dimension of women's oppression. Women had begun to invoke new understandings of a biological dimension of social life. All activities relegated to the domestic realm, the daily reproductive biological activities such as cooking, cleaning, caring for the sick, bearing and nurturing children, and sexuality were now considered worthy of political attention. The great wall between the public and private realm shattered as women began to examine the organic dimension of their own work, lives, and ways of being in the world. In developing the dialectical body politic, women began to examine an organic dimension to social life unexplored by the wider new left. It would not be long before the contradictions between the body and the rest of the natural world would be pressed to give way to an understanding of an ecological body that stands in direct relationship to a political, social world. Phrases including the personal is political, sexual politics, or body politics, all reflected this new tendency to recognize the interconnections between the body and the political, shifting political discussion to include issues deemed organic or embodied, reflecting an implicit ecological impulse. To further contextualize this ecological impulse it is crucial to locate radical feminism within the wider context of the New Left in which a new ecological movement was steadily emerging during the late 1960s. Indeed, during these years, an ecological sensibility had developed, reflecting a rejection of middle-class suburban values, aesthetics, and cultural practices. The publication of the Whole Earth Catalogue in 1968 heralded the arrival of a generation of youth seeking a new quality of everyday life deemed more organic, immediate, and natural. The catalogue's pages offered earthy advice ranging from homesteading in the country to making natural soap in a spirit of ecology and do-it-yourself self-sufficiency. As a feminist correlate, Our Bodies, Ourselves, published in 1973 by the Boston Women's Health Collective, 
offered lay knowledge to women seeking self-sufficiency in the domain of reproductive health. The publication of both books signaled a time in which people sought asylum from a world they perceived as sterile impersonal, and disempowering. The U.S. ecology movement spoke to these desires providing natural alternatives for people striving to reconstitute a more healthful and self-determined quality of everyday life. Along with this new ecological sensibility there emerged within radical feminism an implicit anarchist sensibility as well, a critique of hierarchy in general that flowed from a specific critique of male domination. Seeking to incorporate this spirit of non-hierarchy into feminist projects and organizations, women adopted cooperative ways of working and relating together. By the beginning of the 1970s, a flourishing women's movement had emerged, creating collectives, cooperatives, and consciousness-raising groups, many of which were organized according to principles of non-hierarchy. Women had developed distinctively feminist styles of organization and action, instituting small non-hierarchical groups such as the consciousness-raising group, as the cellular structure from which would emerge a national and international movement. These institutions were designed to give women freedom from particular bodily harms such as rape, battering, and abuse from the male medical establishment. Indeed, projects such as women's health centers, rape crisis centers, and shelters for battered women constituted an institutional expression of the radical feminist demand for freedom from male control of women's bodies. Yet, in addition to representing a demand for freedom from bodily harm and oppression, there was a tendency within radical feminism to demand the freedom to enjoy the body as a site of liberation, passion, and pleasure. Recognizing the degree to which their sexuality, creativity and intelligence had been shaped by men, feminists realized that they could rethink their own bodily experience. Women began to create a new aesthetic based on an affirmation of sexuality intuition, spirituality art, and health. The arrival of innovative forms of women's literature, music, art, theater, dance, and ritual signaled the construction of a universal woman who could forge a new identity based on self-love, power, and creativity. The implicit ecological impulse within radical feminist body politics, then, reflected an emerging social, rather than individualistic, desire for equality of everyday life infused with bodily freedom, safety, and pleasure for all women. Citing patriarchy, or male-dominated hierarchy as the cause of women's oppression, Radical feminism sought to establish a new set of cultural practices defined in opposition to what women often described as a body-hating society. Within this implicit desire for nature, stood a demand for more than abstract values of freedom and justice that marked many of the student movements of the new left. Instead, we see an attempt to ground questions of freedom in everyday social relationships and cultural practices that reflected values of collectivity, sensuality health, and self-determination. The Disembodied Body, The Emergence of Cultural Feminism It is here, however, that the social desire for a new embodied sensibility took a risky turn. Moving from concrete issues of health, safety, and institutional structure to more abstract questions of cultural practice and meaning, radical feminism ventured into the pleasurable yet problematic realm of the symbolic. Questions of how to represent new understandings and practices such as health and spirituality questions of how to symbolically unify women into a universal category that would stand for the cultural feminist subject, became paramount as a movement of predominantly white middle-class women looked to other cultures for inspiration. These cultural feminists attempted to represent new embodied cultural practices of their own everyday lives by deploying new symbols, meanings, and images that they often borrowed from the symbols, times, and places of other cultures. Note. The term cultural feminism emerged during the 70s as a way to point to essentialist notions of sexual difference that surfaced within feminist discussions of sexuality gender, and culture, notions that were embedded in new reconstructions of women's cultural practices including women's music festivals, newspapers, and medical clinics. For an in-depth look at one of the earlier critiques of cultural feminism, written during the thick of the feminist sexuality debates, see Alice Eccles, The New Feminism of Yin and Yang, In Powers of Desire, The Politics of Sexuality eds and Snyto, et al. New York Monthly Review Press, 1983
pages 439 to 460. For a more comprehensive discussion also see Eccles, Daring to be Bad, Radical Feminism in America 1967-75, Minneapolis, University of Minnesota Press, 1989. End note. Rejecting Patriarchal and Hierarchical Approaches to Spirituality Medicine, and Aesthetics, Radical Cultural Feminists Sought Practices Intended to Empower All Women. This search for new cultural practices was again marked by an ecological sensibility as feminists turned to nature-based cultures that had their roots in pagan, Neolithic, Eastern, Indigenous, Native American, and African traditions. However, this turn to the old to reconstruct the new is often characterized by the tendency toward abstraction and romanticization, the desire for an idealized golden age expressed by women who drew inspiration from cultures of the past believed to be free of gendered hierarchy and ecological injustice. The failure of many radical feminists to problematize the process by which they cultivated symbols to represent and routinize feminist nature-based cultural practices contributed to the problem of essentialism within cultural feminism. That many women of color did not identify with symbols that white women deemed universal women's symbols, and that many indigenous women criticized the appropriation by white women of symbols and practices of their own cultures reflects the failure of white radical feminists to be sufficiently self-conscious about the social and political contingencies that constrain the ways in which feminists reconstruct past and present categories of gender and culture. Indeed, in Audre Lorde's essay An Open Letter to Mary Daly, Lord inquired why Daly used symbols from pre-capitalist Western Europe to represent an empowering cultural image of women. Lord asked herself, why doesn't Mary deal with Afrikat as an example? Why are her goddess images only white, Western European, Judeo-Christian? Where was Afrikat, Yemenye, Oyo, and Maolaza? Note. Audrey Lord, an open letter to Mary Daly, in Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches by Audre Lord, New York, The Crossing Press, 1984, p. 67. End note. The radical potential of early feminism, then, was undercut by problems of symbolic representation and cultural practice, problems that reflected deeper issues of institutional racism within the movement. By the mid-1980s, Radical women of color had confronted the feminist movement on its inadequate analysis of race, class, and ethnicity, illustrating that the unified body of the body politic mirrored only a small minority of the diverse world body of women. The 1987 publication of the anthology This Bridge Called My Back, edited by Gloria Anthaldua and Cherie Moraga, signaled an era in which women of color transformed the politics of representation forever. This bridge created a forum in which women who previously had no voice in the feminist movement were able to write critically about issues of race, gender, culture, and power. Note. See Gloria Anthaldua and Cherry Moraga, 2nd edition, This Bridge Called My Back, New York, Kitchen Table Press, 1983. End note. Other feminist writers of color during this time challenged as well an analytical framework predicated on a binary between domestic and public deployed by white feminists at the time. This understanding of a domestic-slash-public split can be traced back to Simone de Beauvoir's 1958 publication of The Second Sex, which rooted the universal cause of women's oppression to be their ghettoization within the embodied realm of domestic sphere and their exclusion from the public sphere of work and culture. For de Beauvoir, women's liberation would follow the liberation of women from this embodied domestic realm into the public sphere enjoyed by men. As Bell Hooks articulated in her 1984 essay Rethinking the Nature of Work, the idea that all women would be liberated by moving beyond the domestic sphere was based on a classist and racist set of assumptions. Quote. Attitudes towards work in much feminist writings reflect bourgeois class biases. Middle-class women shaping feminist thought assumed that the most pressing problem for women was the need to get outside the home and work to cease being just housewives. They were so blinded by their own experiences that they ignored the fact that a vast majority of women were already working outside the home, working in jobs that neither liberated them from dependence on men nor made them economically self-sufficient. End quote. Note. Bell Hooks, Rethinking the Nature of Work in feminist theory, from margin to center, 
Boston, South End Press, 1984, p. 98. End note. In this way, questions of race and class complexified previously universal notions of gender and the body tied to the feminist project. No longer was woman a universal subject trapped within a timeless domestic sphere, the escape from which would provide universal liberation. Indeed, for poor women of color who had been working outside the home for centuries, there had clearly been no such liberation. As the writers in this bridge illustrated, the body politic, originally intended to counter the abstract politics of men in the new left, had given rise to a cultural feminism that presented a new set of abstractions. Just as the new left had organized its political agenda within liberal and universal categories of man, and justice, generalized from a particular privileged group of white men, the radical feminist movement had organized its agenda around universal categories of woman and domesticity generalized from a privileged group of white women. By failing to sufficiently articulate issues of race, class, and ethnicity, radical feminists were unable to fully clarify the many social factors that determine the particular ways in which women experience and resist oppression. Audrey Lord, again, in her letter to Mary Daly, questioned Daly on the white bias surrounding her body politics, stating, quote, You fail to recognize that, as women, there are, vital, differences which we do not all share. For instance, breast cancer, three times the number of unnecessary event rations, hysterectomies and sterilizations as for white women, three times as many chances of being raped, murdered, or assaulted as exist for white women. These are statistical facts, not coincidences, nor paranoid fantasies. End quote. Note. Lord, Sister Outsider, P70. End note. Audrey Lord was one of the first radical feminists to bring to body politics an understanding of the relationship between race, health, class, and gender. In her groundbreaking work, The Cancer Journals, Lord examined the specific social context in which she had been exposed to toxins at home and at work. Note. Audrey Lord, The Cancer Journals, San Francisco, Spinsters Inc., 1980, end note. In addition, she articulated the specific social contexts in which she faced her own medical crises and recovery. Lord's perspective anticipated the struggles of women of color in the environmental justice movement of the 1980s, a struggle to bring questions of race and class into an ecologically oriented body politic. Thus the body politics, which offered a potential organic ground for radical feminism, was constrained by a tendency toward abstraction and romanticization. Indeed, degrees of immediacy and historicity were lost in the translation as white women began to extrapolate from their own lives a politics of representation that often either appropriated or excluded the experience of women of color. And as we shall see, this problem of how to engender new meanings surrounding categories of non-hierarchy, body gender, and nature, persisted as a nascent desire for nature continued to emerge within radical feminism. Yet despite these limitations, by framing issues of health, sexual freedom, rape, and battering, as political issues, radical feminists began to move toward a social, rather than individualistic, desire for nature, expressing a collective desire for a more healthful, pleasurable, and natural expression of everyday life free from social oppression. In turn, the nascent anarchist impulse that marked the cooperative structure of feminist organizations speaks to the revolutionary potential within feminist body politics. Body Ecology, The Emergence of Eco-Feminism To explore the movement of radical feminist body politics into an explicit desire for nature, we will return briefly to the earlier days of the movement. Here, once again, we witness a set of mostly white, middle-class activists for whom ecological questions will represent an attempt to make sense out of abstract understandings of categories of nature and gender, understandings that will reflect their own identities. The witch movement represents one of the first feminist actions that expressed an explicit ecological sensibility. At this time, feminists began to articulate moments of resonance between the idea of a new embodied political culture and the culture of witches in pagan Europe hundreds of years ago. Beginning on Halloween, 1968, 
radical feminists formed a series of autonomous covens across the country. The group was explicitly non-hierarchical, and their style was theatrical, humorous, and passionately strident. They expressed a brilliance of wit in their ever-changing acronyms ranging from women's international terrorist conspiracy from hell, and women infuriated at taking care of hoodlums, to women interested in toppling consumption holidays. A coven in New York City leafleted a statement that would anticipate later eco-feminist writings. Quote. Which is an all-woman everything. It's theater, revolution, magic, terror, joy garlic flowers, spells. It's an awareness that witches and gypsies were the original guerrillas and resistance fighters against oppression, particularly the oppression of women, down through the ages. Witches have always been women who dared to be, groovy, courageous, aggressive, intelligent, nonconformist, explorative, curious, independent, sexually liberated, revolutionary. This possibly explains why nine million of them have been burned. Witches were the first friendly heads and dealers, the first birth control practitioners and abortionists, the first alchemists, turn dross into gold and you devalue the whole idea of money. They bowed to no man, being the living remnants of the oldest culture of all, one in which men and women were equal sharers in a truly cooperative society before the death-dealing sexual, economic and spiritual repression of the imperialist phallic society took over and began to destroy nature and human society. End quote. Note. Which statement, in Sisterhood is Powerful Ed. Robin Morgan, New York, Vintage Books, 1970, p. 539. End note. In one action, a coven in Washington, D.C. hexed the United Fruit Company because of their oppressive policy on the Third World and on secretaries in its offices at home. A leaflet distributed at the demonstration contained the spell. Quote. Bananas and rifles, sugar and death, war for profit, tarantula's breath, United Fruit makes lots of loot, the CIA is in its boot. End quote. Note. E. Beatum, p. 539. End note. As early as 1969, women were beginning to bring together an analysis of militarism, capitalism, sexism and colonialism that was regarded as destroying nature and human society. In this action we see a light-hearted, yet significant, backward-looking impulse that will mark both cultural feminism and later forms of cultural eco-feminism. The witty and romantic appeal to a witch culture of the past represents an attempt by a group of mainly white suburban youth to invoke the idea of an era that was more cooperative and ecological. In 1978, Susan Griffin wrote Woman and Nature, a book-length prose poem that juxtaposed objectified representations of women with managerial writings about plant and animal nature. Note. Susan Griffin, Woman and Nature, The Roaring Inside Her, New York, Harper and Row, 1978. End note. Griffin's book, which soon became part of an emerging radical feminist ecological canon, was influential in revealing the socially constructed correspondence between ideas of woman and nature within capitalist patriarchy. In 1980, Carolyn Merchant published an important feminist perspective on the scientific revolution, further contributing to this newly developing feminist ecological literature. Merchant's book, The Death of Nature, discussed the historical relationship between capitalism, modern science, and women's oppression. Note. Carolyn Merchant, The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology and the Scientific Revolution, San Francisco, Harper and Row, 1980. End note. Merchant, a socialist feminist, articulated how patriarchy and capitalism functioned together to control both woman and nature. During these years, the body politic expanded to address not only understandings of women's physical survival and vitality but ideas of global survival in general. Once early feminists asserted that patriarchy had invaded their very bodies, it wasn't a big leap for them to assert that the same system had invaded the rest of the natural world as well. However, the ways in which women articulated the causes of ecological problems varied immensely. In both the witch movement and in the writings of Merchant, there is a critique of capitalism that names capitalism in particular, not just patriarchy in general, 
as a primary cause of ecological malaise. In contrast, Susan Griffin's book displays the universalizing tendency that marked much of 1970s radical feminism, a tendency to identify man in the abstract as the cause of ecological injustice. Quote, the fact that man does not consider himself a part of nature, but indeed considers himself superior to matter, seemed to me to gain significance when placed against man's attitude that woman is both inferior to him and closer to nature. Hence this book called Woman and Nature Grew. End quote. Note. Griffin, Woman, and Nature, p. 15. End note. Yet while Griffin reproduces the essentialist tendency that had emerged within cultural feminism, she does extend a radical feminist analysis of social hierarchy to an exploration of ecological concerns. According to Griffin, Problems of sexism and ecological malaise are caused by men who regard themselves as superior to, rather than part of, nature. Thus in Woman and Nature, Griffin suggests the idea of a potentially complementary relationship between society and nature, given the right social conditions. By the early 80s, feminists began to define the organic sensibility latent within radical feminist body politics in more explicitly ecological terms. Note. However, it is vital to note that the emergence of an ecological sensibility within the feminist body politics of the New Left did not negate or even necessarily inform radical feminism itself. Today strains of radical feminism continue to evolve independent of an ecological focus or analysis. An ecological orientation was not endorsed by radical feminists who maintained that it detracted from an agenda that primarily addresses women's immediate needs for bodily integrity and civil rights. End note. Radical feminists began to develop the idea of a time that was prior to social and ecological injustice, a time in which women had more power and control over their everyday relationships with each other and with nature. Women began to cultivate a desire for nature that conveyed a yearning for a more cooperative way of life free of sexism and ecological degradation. The anti-nuclear movement and eco-feminist activism of the early 1980s bringing together peace and ecology. During this time, another movement had been gaining steam. In the 70s, anti-nuclear activism emerged as one of the most potent political forces within the New Left. In particular, the nuclear issue brought together both radical feminists involved in feminist peace politics and women interested in ecology. While nuclear militarism resonated with concerns of feminists peace activists, Nuclear power became the focus for feminists concerned with problems of ecology and health. Continuing to utilize the domestic public framework introduced in the 1960s, many radical feminists extended their critique of domestic acts of male violence such as rape and battering, to include a critique of public and institutional acts of male violence such as militarism. It was in this context that many women began to make connections between the domination of women in the domestic sphere with impersonal, sexual relationships, and the destruction of the natural world by public institutions such as the military and the nuclear industry. The feminist peace movement, emerging out of radical feminism and the civil rights and anti-war movements, greatly informed a newly emerging eco-feminist activism. Inspired by the philosophy of anti-racist peace activists such as Barbara Deming, feminists had been developing an anti-militarist movement in response to mounting U.S. aggression. Learning of the nuclear testing in Nevada in the 50s and the subsequent rise in birth defects and gynecological cancers, they also discovered the current problem of nuclear waste for which there was no safe means of disposal. And while appreciating the ecological implications of nuclear energy feminists also addressed the military implications of an industry that produced plutonium necessary for nuclear warheads. The issues of militarism, male violence, and ecology came together to form a truly ecological, broad-based body politic. In 1980, the crisis at the nuclear reactor on Three Mile Island served as the catalyst for a beginning of eco-feminist direct action. This first major eco-feminist event was initiated by feminist activists Inistra King and Celeste Wesson during an interview on WBAI Radio in New York in which they discussed the crisis from a specifically eco-feminist perspective. The following April, King and Wesson, along with a group of other feminist, peace and environmental activists, organized the Conference on Women and Life on Earth, 
ecofeminism in the 80s in which 800 women gathered in Amherst, Massachusetts to address the nuclear question. Many of the conference organizers and attendees identified as social anarchists who had been involved in the anti-nuclear movement. Out of this conference emerged an ecofeminist network that, in 1981, planned the first ecofeminist action, the Women's Pentagon Action, WPA, in which 3,000 women participated in a massive theatrical ecofeminist demonstration in Washington, D.C. The WPA was an ecofeminist and anti-militarist action whose unity statement, written collectively and arranged by Grace Paley, tied together issues of feminism, capitalism, ecology anti-racism, and anti-militarism. Quote. With that sense, that ecological right, we oppose the financial connections between the Pentagon and the multinational corporations and banks that the Pentagon serves. Those connections are made of gold and oil. We are made of blood and bone, we are made of the sweet and finite resource, water. We will not allow these violent games to continue. If we are here in our stubborn thousands today we will certainly return in the hundreds of thousands in the months and years to come. End note. Note. Unity Statement Women's Pentagon Action, 1980, in Innistra King, What is Ecofeminism? New York, Ecofeminist Resources, 1990. End note. In the first WPA action, there was another the following year, activists used a style reminiscent of the witch actions, circling the Pentagon to express rage, sadness and fear about the history of male violence by performing street theater on the Pentagon's steps. While the WPAs echoed the sensibility of the witch movement, they also echoed the domestic sensibility of an earlier anti-nuclear movement of 1962, known as the Women's Strike for Peace movement, in which women from across the country identifying as mothers, rather than as feminists, demonstrated against the nuclear testing that had taken place in the 50s. Whereas radical feminism had been often criticized for espousing an anti-mother sentiment, traced back to de Beauvoir's assertion of women's need to transcend the maternal activities associated with the domestic sphere, early eco-feminists reversed de Beauvoir's assertion, arguing instead that women must restore value to the roles of mothering and nurturing. This motherist sensibility, often blamed for creating yet another romantic essentialism, was translated into the creation of a form of direct action that came to be associated with eco-feminist actions in the future. Blending both witchy and motherist sensibilities, the WPAs created a new kind of distinctively eco-feminist aesthetics. At the WPAs, women wove webs of yarn containing symbols of mothers' everyday lives such as aprons, clothespins, photographs of children as well as artifacts from women's everyday lives around fences, doors and missile sites as described by Anistra King. Quote. We create an iconography designed to bring people to life, parading with enormous puppets, quilting scenes from everyday life, weaving the doors of the Pentagon closed with brilliantly colored yarn, waltzing around police barricades, shaking down fences, spray-painting runways, placing photos of beloved places in nature and children woven in the miles of fencing around military installations, wearing flowers and brilliant colors as we face into the gray and cocky of militarism. Opposing machines with handcrafted alternatives. End quote. Note. Innistra King, if I can't dance in your revolution, I'm not coming, in rocking the ship of state, toward a feminist peace politics, eds Adrian Harris and Innistra King, Boulder, Westview Press, 1989, p. 282. End note. By reversing, yet reproducing, the domestic public split as an analytical framework, the WPA began to counter the values of capitalist consumerism and state militarism by expressing a new revalorization of the everyday life of the domestic sphere. By 1981, an international eco-feminist network had emerged. Ecofeminism, with its analysis of the interconnectedness of oppressions and its insistence on the need for international dialogue, provided a global forum for addressing women's social and ecological crises. In response to this missile crisis, a group of British peace and ecology activists, along with the recently established group Women and Life on Earth in England, created the Greenham Common Peace Encampment at the military base located there. At the time, 
Greenham represented an ongoing international direct action, a demonstration of women's work of everyday survival in a patriarchal nuclear age. Setting up camp outside the gates of the base women lived in tents and shelters and were re-evicted each morning by the military police. Subsequently in solidarity with Greenham, women in the U.S. founded the Seneca Women's Peace Encampment in Seneca Falls, New York, to protest cruise missiles that were positioned to leave Seneca for Europe. Note. See Gwyn Kirk, R. Greenham Common, Feminism and Nonviolence, in Rocking the Ship of State, Toward a Feminist Peace Politics, eds Adrian Harris and Inistra King, Boulder, Westview Press, 1989 pages 115 to 130. End note. Finally in the mid-1980s, a group of eco-feminists began to specifically address issues of race and class in relationship to the eco-feminist project. Initiated in 1984, the Woman Earth Feminist Peace Institute was founded by a group of radical women of color, eco-feminists and feminist peace activists including Inistra King, Gwyn Kirk, Barbara Smith, Rachel Bagby, Lucy Tish, and Star Hawk, who came together to create a multiracial, multicultural forum in which women could discuss issues of race, gender, class, peace, spirituality, and ecology. Following the suggestion of Barbara Smith, Woman Earth became the first feminist institute to be organized around the principle of racial parity giving equal voice, participation, and leadership to both women of color and white women. Note. For a sensitive and thorough discussion of woman earth, as well as an exploration of issues of race and class in eco-feminist politics in general, see Noel Sturgeon, Eco-Feminist Natures, Race, Gender, Feminist Theory and Political Action, New York, Routledge, 1997. End note. While Woman Earth sought to become an educational and political institute that could provide a base for an eco-feminist movement, Internal struggles within the organizing group regarding race and class privilege, in addition to financial pressures, led to the eventual dissolution of the project in 1989. As Noel Sturgeon points out, however, Woman Earth still serves as an example of a moment in eco feminist history in which white eco feminists placed questions of racial privilege and power at the center of their political agenda. The commitment that eco-feminists brought to this project was reflected in Woman Earth's conference Reconstituting Feminist Peace Politics held in Amherst, Massachusetts, in June of 1986, a conference in which 50 women, half women of color, half women of European descent, met to discuss a range of issues relating to questions of race, class, and feminist peace politics. Woman Earth signaled an important shift within eco-feminism. Responding to critiques of racism within the feminist movement as a whole in the mid-1980s, women such as King understood that eco-feminism had to prioritize the question of racism if the movement was to achieve political validity and integrity. Note. Sturgeon, Eco-Feminist Natures, p. 82. End note. Woman Earth, as an eco-feminist project emerged out of radical feminist body politics that sought to particularize the general question of ecology by addressing issues of nature along with those of gender and social justice. Initially, the nuclear issue brought out the most concrete social, and historical dimensions of the nature question within eco-feminism. Departing from mainstream environmentalism's tendency to privilege abstract notions of a pristine and people-less wilderness to be protected, these early eco-feminist activists generally expressed their desire for nature by showing the concrete connections between public and domestic acts of militarism and male violence, pointing to the ecological and social implications of such issues. Again, although early eco-feminist activism tended to reproduce the problematic domestic-slash-public framework, they were able to ground their politics in a social and material analysis of ecological questions. Thus, in the early 1980s, radical feminism had given rise to an increasingly social approach to ecological questions that grew out of a body politics grounded in the concrete dimensions of women's everyday lives. This body politics was predicated upon the ability of radical feminists to link questions such as health and sexuality to systems of male-dominated hierarchy, reflecting a nascent, and sometimes explicit, anarchist impulse.
And as we have seen this nascent anarchism within body politics finds expression within early eco-ferninist claims regarding the connection between ecological degradation and questions of social domination and oppression in general. Social Ecology and Ecofeminism At this point in the narrative, it would be helpful to take a few steps back to explore a key political and theoretical context in which Inistra King, a major figure in the early years of ecofeminist activity developed ecofeminist theory and activism. King's approach to ecological theory and politics both informed, and was formed by, another desire for nature that unfolded simultaneously with the radical feminist movement. That desire for nature is social ecology. Social ecology is a branch of the radical ecology movement that surfaced in the U.S. during the 1960s. Since its inception, social ecology has played a major role in shaping radical ecological politics both in the U.S. and abroad by pushing ecological discussion in a social anarchist direction to include critiques of capitalism, the state, and all forms of social and political hierarchy. Beginning in the early 1960s, Murray Bookchin, the theorist primarily associated with the theory, began to examine the social and political origins of ecological problems from a leftist perspective. While offering a philosophical and historical analysis of the relationship between society and nature, social ecology is praxis-based, calling not only for direct action, but for a reconstructive vision of a confederation of communities engaged in direct democracy and municipalized economics. While an ecological sensibility emerged within the body politics of radical feminism in the 1960s and 70s, a nascent feminist sensibility surfaced within social ecology. The common denominator that led both radical feminists and social ecology to make the connection between ecology and feminism can be traced back to the anarchist impulse within both theories. While early feminist analysis of hierarchy led to a critique of the patriarchal project to dominate nature, the social and ecological analysis of hierarchy led to a critique of systems of male domination. Inspired by the newly emerging radical feminist movement, Bookchin too, saw in feminism, as he saw in ecology the potential for a movement that was general enough to include, yet not be limited to, economic concerns. Like others, Bookchin saw feminism as potentially one of the great issues that, like ecology democracy and urbanization, could bring to the revolutionary struggle those who faced hierarchical as well as class oppression. Note. Murray Bookchin, Personal Communication, June 11, 1998. End note. He recognized in feminism the potential for a trans-class movement that could lead to an anti-hierarchical position that could ultimately challenge capitalism. In 1978, the Institute for Social Ecology, ISE, which Bookchin co-founded in 1974, invited Inistra King to develop what would become the first curriculum in a feminist approach to ecology thus coining the term ecofeminism. Note. As ecofeminism has grown in popularity there has been significant confusion regarding the origins of the term and of the movement itself. While during the early 1980s, the term, still largely unknown in many feminist circles, was most closely associated with the Women's Pentagon action of which King was a primary organizer, the mid to late 1980s brought newcomers unfamiliar with the movement's origins. In recent years, many have attributed the origins of the term ecofeminism to an article written in 1974 by Françoise Diobane entitled Le Perninisme au la mort, Paris, Pierre Ori, 1974. However, the article did not reach English-speaking audiences until 1994, in an essay translated by Ruth Hoddle as The Time for Ecofeminism, in Carolyn Merchant, ed., Key Concepts in Critical Theory, Ecology, Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, Humanities Press, 1994, almost 15 years after the theory and movement had emerged as a way to explicitly link an anti-militarist, anti-capitalist, and anti-patriarchal stance to questions of ecology. Though a version of the Diobane essay did appear in 1980, in Elaine Marx and Isabelle de Court Yvonne, eds. New French Feminisms, an anthology, Amherst, University of Massachusetts Press, 1980, this version does not explicitly mention ecofeminism. feminism
examining the lineage of the term is a way to explore the specific historical context in which eco-feminist theory and action emerged. Attempts to trace the eco-feminist movement itself back to Diobane obfuscate the historical continuity between eco-feminist curriculum and writing that emerged at the ISE by King, and the wider context of the U.S. New Left made up of activists involved in the radical feminist movement, the feminist peace movement, the anti-war movement, and the anti-nuclear movement. End note. As there were not yet any explicitly eco-feminist writings, King created the first eco-feminist curriculum which reviewed essays written by theorists including liberal, socialist, radical feminist, and anti-militarist thinkers, as well as feminist anthropologists and feminist philosophers of science. Through a critical reading of these essays, King explored the evolution of feminist thinking from the first to the second wave, looking at moments of liberalism, rationalism and essentialism within the different strands of feminist theory examining their implications for ecological theory and feminist peace politics. Bringing together insights gleaned from both social ecology and feminist epistemology, King developed a way to rethink the self-other relationship central to both ecology and feminism. In particular, King drew from feminist theorists such as Nancy Chodoro, Gail Rubin, and Sherry Ortner, examining the historical implications of the Western nature-culture dichotomy for the construction of gender. For King, the woman-nature analogy was a social, rather than biological, construction that she sought to historicize and appropriate as a way to develop a feminist critique of the epistemological foundations of Western society. According to King, this analogy was directly linked to a nature-culture split which was in turn, tied to the domestic-public dichotomy discussed by white feminists during the late 1960s and early 70s. Note. Indeed. Many of the anthropological texts written by feminists during the late 1960s and early 70s used the domestic-slash-public split as a key analytical framework. For a glimpse into this discussion, see 1 VOMAN, Culture and Society eds Michelle Zimbalist Rosaldo and Louise Lamphere, Stanford, Stanford University Press, 1974. End note. Again, departing from de Beauvoir. King called for women to analyze the historical construction of that dichotomy as a way to understand men's alienation from domestic realms of nature and the body rather than for women to join men in the project of transcendence over nature. However the failure of King, and of many white feminists at the time, to problematize the domestic public split itself, left early eco-feminist theory vulnerable to critiques of essentialism. That continue today. As already stated, the tendency among white feminists during those years to focus on the domestic-public dichotomy reflected unexamined assumptions regarding the universality of the structural causes of women's subordination. Again, as theorists such as Bell Hooks pointed out, poor women of color in the U.S. had always been forced into the public sphere of work, without transcending their oppression as women. Yet while retaining this problematic domestic-public framework, King's approach to eco-feminism was profoundly radical in a variety of ways. Social ecology had provided an explicitly revolutionary anarchist, an ecological lens through which King analyzed questions regarding objectivity raised by feminist psychoanalytic theorists, scientists, and anthropologists. Offering a way to ecologize the Hegelian dialectic between self and other, social ecology articulated the need for society to create a relationship with the rest of the natural world marked by degrees of cooperation, complementary and ever greater levels of freedom. Social ecology's discussion of unity in diversity also provided a way to reconcile the relationship between self and other by articulating the possibility for recognizing both the differences and connections between organic phenomena. Within the ecologized dialectic of social ecology the self could be both related to, and distinct from, the other. King drew out the feminist implications of social ecology exploring non-hierarchical and anarchic ways of approaching self-other relationships in domains of political and ecological organizing and theory, in addition to teaching at the ISE King went on to create the first body of writing to be called explicitly eco-feminist creating an innovative synthesis of theories including social ecology radical feminist body politics, feminist critiques of science, feminist peace politics, and critical theory. Note
King continued to teach at the ISE through the 1980s and participated in the ISE's annual colloquium on ecofeminism until 1994. For a more comprehensive discussion of the relationship between King, Bookshin, and the ISE see Noel Stigion's book Ecofeminist Natures, London, Routledge, 1997, pages 32-40. End note. Yet while King sought to integrate feminist and social ecological theory, she articulated in turn, the need for a feminist dimension to the theory of social ecology. Quote. The perspective that self-consciously attempts to integrate both biological and social aspects of the relationship between human beings and their environment is known as social ecology, while this analysis is useful, social ecology without feminism is incomplete. Feminism grounds this critique of domination by identifying the prototype of other forms of domination, that of man over woman. End quote. Note. Inistra King, What is Ecofeminism? In What is Ecofeminism, ed. Gwyn Kirk, New York, Ecofeminist Resources, 1990, p. 26. End note. In this way, King drew out the feminist implications of social ecology exploring new ways of examining the relationship between systems of male domination and ecological crises in general from a perspective informed by social anarchism. Although feminists such as those in the Witch Collective were drawing similar connections between oppressions almost a decade earlier, King made the articulations between forms of social hierarchy explicit, demonstrating their relationship to ecological injustice. King's grounding in anarchist theory and social ecology allowed her to avoid many of the epistemological traps into which feminists fell during those years. Through a social ecological critique of hierarchy, she recognized the need to abolish all forms of oppression, while emphasizing as well, the potential for political collaboration between women of different class, race, and ethnic backgrounds. King's key role in establishing Woman Earth as well her participation in international feminist forums such as the United Nations Conference on Women in Nairobi in 1985, reflect her epistemological sensitivity to questions of difference as well as her anarchistic appreciation of the need to simultaneously fight against all forms of hierarchy and oppression. King's ecofeminism did more than just recognize the importance of making connections between different forms of social and ecological injustice it recognized the importance of making connections between different women all over the world to counter these interconnected crises. Repeatedly in her writings, King expressed the need to create face-to-face -face dialogue between women, both internationally and cross-culturally within the United States, to create unified anti-racist strategies to address women's diverse struggles for social and ecological justice. Ecofeminism, Environmental Justice, and International Environmentalism to fully appreciate the historical distinctiveness of King's participation in multicultural and anti-racist projects such as Woman Earth, we must locate it within a larger history of both the feminist and ecology movements of the mid-1980s. As a mostly white feminist movement was being challenged regarding problems of racism and essentialism, the ecology movement was confronted on its exclusion of the concerns and participation of communities of color. Woman Earth most particularly reflected the simultaneity of these challenges as white women active in both feminist and ecology movements began to prioritize the issue of race within both the feminist and ecological agenda. While Woman Earth was forming, two other forums emerged in which women addressed questions of race, culture, class, and ecology, the environmental justice movement and the movement surrounding feminist international environmental politics. I include a discussion of these movements as a way to depict the wider, politicized climate of the environmental movement in which ecofeminism was located in the mid-1980s to better contextualize concerns faced by ecofeminists during this time. During the mid-1980s, the grassroots anti-toxics movement, which had previously been composed of mostly white communities fighting toxic dumping, also began to undergo a transformation. Activists of color who had fought for decades against environmental injustices that targeted their communities throughout the U.S., began to take leadership in this movement, and within the wider environmental movement, linking questions of social, political, and economic justice to the ecological question. They began to recast issues previously regarded as community or social problems in ecological terms. In so doing, 
they appropriated an ecological discourse from which they had been marginalized. The anti-racist wing of the environmental justice movement emerged in response to the marginalization of people of color from the mainly white ecological milieu. To mainstream white environmentalists, community-based struggles of activists of color are often understood as social rather than environmental. Note. Robert D. Bullard, Introduction in Confronting Environmental Racism, Voices from the Grassroots, ed. Robert D. Bullard, Boston, South End Press, 1993, p. 9. End note. Ongoing attempts within poor communities of color to secure services such as paved streets, sewers, indoor plumbing in addition to struggles for a pleasurable quality of everyday life, have been largely ignored by mainstream environmentalists as such issues often fall outside of, or between, the boundary that separates the city and the country, a boundary that exists within the Euro-American environmental imagination. In this way, then, neither the cityscape nor the poor rural community in which activists of color work to achieve quality of life, fit white categories of social and environmental. Indeed, according to activist and theorist Dorsetta E. Taylor, the myth that people of color are unconcerned with environmental issues is allowed to continue due to the way that white mainstream environmentalists frame and strategically address ecological problems. Note. Taylor, Dorsetta E. Environmentalism and the Politics of Inclusion. Confronting Environmental Racism Voices from the Grassroots, ed. Robert D. Bullard, Boston, South End Press. 1993, p. 58. End note. However, by the late 1980s an environmental coalition of activists emerged from within the African American, Native American, Puerto Rican, Latino, and Asian and Pacific Islander communities, a coalition to fight environmental racism. Environmental racism includes the official sanctioning of polluting industries, poisons, and pollutants in communities of color in addition to the exclusion of people of color from environmental policy making, regulatory bodies, and from mainstream environmental groups. Unlike mainstream environmentalism or deep ecology the struggle against environmental racism does not historically emerge from an abstract or romantic desire for nature expressed as a yearning to protect a pre-social idea of nature but from an historical appreciation of the inseparable conditions of ecological and social injustice. Unlike early eco-feminist theory that emerged out of the analytical framework of domestic-slash-public or nature-slash-culture, the environmental justice movement tended to deploy categories defined in terms of race, class, and culture. For activists in the environmental justice movement, environmental problems are not seen to be the result of man's alienation from an embodied, domestic sphere identified with women. Instead, environmental injustice is seen to be the consequence of a specifically Western, racist, and capitalist society that has constructed itself at the ecological and cultural expense of poor communities of color. Thus, in the movement for environmental justice, we see another expression of the desire for nature, a desire for ecological integrity that reflects yet another set of identities and situations. Often identifying as members of indigenous cultures or communities of color struggling for survival, rather than as feminists, a term emerging out of white middle-class context, a new wave of women leaders arose during the 1980s, changing the ecological landscape in the U.S. Over the past 10 years, women such as Winona Law Duke, Peggy Dye, Dorsetta E. Taylor, Vernice Miller, and Cynthia Hamilton have emerged as internationally recognized leaders in the struggle to end environmental injustice. According to Cynthia Hamilton, quote, Women often play a primary part in community action because it is about things they know best. Minority women in several urban areas have found themselves part of a new radical core as the new wave of environmental action, precipitated by the irrationalities of capital-intensive growth has catapulted them forward. These individuals are responding not to nature in the abstract but to the threat to their homes and to the health of their children. End quote. Note. Cynthia Hamilton, Women, Home, and Community, The Struggle in an Urban Environment, In Reweaving the World, The Emergence of Ecofeminism, E.D.S. Gloria Orenstein and Irene Diamond, San Francisco, Sierra Club Books, 1992. P. 217. End note.
women active in struggles against environmental racism have particularized the ecological question with a politics grounded in an analysis of history, capitalism, and racism. During a time when many deep ecologists and mainstream environmentalists rarely speak of capitalism as a factor in ecological and social devastation, referring instead to euphemisms such as technology modern society, or industrial society, environmental justice activists, such as Cynthia Hamilton, have consistently named capitalism as a primary force behind ecological and social injustice. Women in the environmental justice movement became a source of inspiration to white eco-feminists who, by the mid-1980s, were at a loss for how to reconstitute an activist base for the movement. Indeed. In contrast to the eco-feminist movement which was constituted in national anti-militarist campaigns, women involved in the fight for environmental justice were engaged in community-based, struggles for cultural and ecological justice tied to everyday issues ranging from land rights to toxic waste. Yet while white ecologists have often been drawn to the work of environmental justice activists such as Winona Law Duke, often seeking their endorsement of the movement, Ecofeminism per se has not held significant appeal or relevance to women engaged in local struggles for community and cultural survival. Women in these movements tend to identify as community or environmental rather than feminist activists. Though the two groups are primarily led by women engaged in ecological concerns, there has been little overlap between environmental justice organizing and ecofeminism. In turn, the continuing segregation of communities of color and white communities, combined with unresolved tendencies toward white bias within feminist theory, have greatly impeded the formation of coalitions between white eco-feminists and women of color active in the environmental justice movement. Within this context, Woman Earth represented an important moment in eco-feminist history. Recognizing that a multicultural, Multiracial projects such as Woman Earth would require intentional and careful planning involving both white women and women of color from the beginning stages. Woman Earth signaled an attempt by eco feminists to address racial constraints that hindered the movement from fulfilling its potential. Rare moments such as Woman Earth reflect the racialized context of ecological politics in the U.S., complexifying abstract notions of woman and nature that lingered within eco feminist theory during these years. There has been considerably greater overlap between eco-feminists in the North and women in South engaged in development discourse. This coming together was originally facilitated by two international conferences sponsored by the United Nations, UN, Decade for Women designed to provide forums in which women could meet to discuss their economic and social status in an international setting. Launched in 1975, the decade for women intended to trace the improving status of poor women in the third world during the 10 years of a UN-funded development campaign. However, the research instead revealed that the lives of many poor women had actually worsened during the 10 years, as women had to bear not only the declining economic conditions brought on by a new phase of neocolonialism, but the ongoing burdens of sexism as well. Note. Jita Sen and Karen Grohn, Development, Crises, and Alternative Visions, New York, Monthly Review Press, 1987, p. 29. End note. At the end of the decade, in 1985, the UN sponsored the second UN Conference on Women in Nairobi, stimulating unprecedented discussion between Northern and Southern feminist activists, shedding light on the global, diverse, and complex nature of women's approaches to social and ecological questions. The Nairobi Conference signaled the beginning of a new international phase of feminist activism and dialogue that, like the publication of this bridge, began to challenge universal categories of gender, as well as domestic-slash-public binaries, that marked white eco-feminism in the U.S. In addition, as women in the South spoke publicly about multiple issues of globalization, cultural identity, and development, they began to challenge essentialist understandings of the monolithic third world woman or indigenous woman that were embedded within white feminism of the 1980s. For many poor women in third world situations, discussions of development reflect a desire for ecological integrity, that in turn, are born out of a particular set of identities and situations. For many in the South, the desire for nature is rooted in an analysis and critique of colonialism, global capital, sexism, and environmental policy, rather than out of a nature-culture dualism.
Within such discussions, nature itself is a contentious ground owned and controlled by international regulatory agencies, development agencies, and trade agreements. In turn, nature also often represents a set of agricultural, economic, medicinal, spiritual, and cultural practices based on local knowledge built up over generations. For women in subsistence economies, ecology often represents the day-to-day -day articulations between an encroaching global capitalist economy governmental formations, and traditional organic cultural symbolic practices. In turn, for many poor southern women undergoing processes of proletarianization within newly emerging industrialized contexts, ecological issues mean not only poisoned water and air, but toxic workplaces where women are exposed to harmful chemicals, overwork, and underpay which keep women in a continual state of stress and poverty. Through international dialogue, women addressing issues surrounding development began to articulate a global feminism that brings together the economic, cultural, and ecological insights of women in both the North and South. Vandana Shiva, one of the few environmental activists from the South to identify with the term eco-feminism, has emerged as a major voice in global feminist forums. In her work over the last 15 years, Shiva has articulated the struggles of women in rural India to resist colonial policies of deforestation, agriculture, and land use. In particular, as a socialist eco-feminist, Shiva has been instrumental in elucidating issues relating to biotechnology and seed patenting, tying issues of biotechnology to the larger struggle between neocolonialism, global capital, ecological sustainability, and women's local knowledge. Note. Vandana Shiva has contributed profoundly to a historical and anti-capitalist eco-feminist critique of the intersection between patriarchy colonialism, global capital and ecological degradation. See Vandana Shiva and Maria Mize, Eco-Feminism, London, Z Books, 1993. End note. The emergence of post-colonial feminist discussion in the mid-1980s brought U.S. eco-feminists engaged in such forums into a transnational feminist movement. Eco-feminists have assumed leadership in international forums such as the Women's Environment and Development Organization, WEDO, which sponsored the World Women's Congress for a Healthy Planet in November of 1991. While WEDO is not an explicitly eco-feminist organization, a distinct eco-feminist perspective is visible within their literature that still emphasizes the woman-nature dichotomy and the question of peace. Indeed, Weddow's Declaration of Interdependence of 1989 is reminiscent of the Women's Pentagon Actions Unity Statement almost a decade before, quote, It is our belief that man's dominion over nature parallels the subjugation of women in many societies, denying them sovereignty over their lives and bodies. Until all societies truly value women and the environment, their joint degradation will continue. Women's views on economic justice, human rights, reproduction, and the achievement of peace must be heard at local, national, and international forums, wherever policies are made that could affect the future of life on Earth. Partnership among all peoples is essential for the survival of the planet. End quote. Yet while retaining some of the analytical categories of its earlier anti-militarist days, U.S. eco-feminists in international forums such as WEDO have sought to link questions of nature to issues of gender, social justice, and health, thus expressing a desire for nature that tends to be socially, rather than individually, based. Again, when we compare WEDO's declaration to anti-humanist statements written by many in the deep ecology movement during the late 1980s, we can better appreciate the significance of eco-feminist attempts to raise questions of economic justice, human rights, reproduction, and the achievement of peace in relation to the question of ecology. The shift from an eco-feminism derived from a US-based anti-militarist movement to a transnational eco-feminism focused on questions of development, complexified eco-feminist theory, both broadening and grounding the idea of the ecological subject. As poor women in the South inscribed issues of development, colonialism, and globalization as ecological, they unsettled universal assumptions often built into Northern eco-feminists' desires for nature. U.S. Eco-Feminism of the Late 1980s and Beyond While eco-feminists from the U.S. participated in international feminist forums during the mid-1980s, 
an autonomous eco-feminist movement in their own country began to wind down. The early years of U.S. eco-feminist activity were for many the high point of the movement's history. Punctuated by the Women and Life on Earth Conference, WPAs, Seneca Peace Encampment, Woman Earth and an array of local actions in the Northeast and throughout the country these short years in the early 1980s were a time in which U.S. Ecofeminism was particularly rooted in an activist tradition originally constituted by the New Left. Indeed, by the late 1980s, although many individual ecofeminists were active in green movements, struggles for animal rights, and forest defense work, there was little to suggest that autonomous ecofeminist activism would be revived. If ecofeminism did not take to the streets, it took to the many literary and educational forums that would proliferate over the next decade. The bursts of early ecofeminist activity had captured the imaginations of a wide range of activists, students, and scholars interested in feminist critiques of science, environmentalism, animal rights, feminist theology, and feminist philosophy both within and outside of the academy. By the early 1990s, there were three ecofeminist anthologies, an array of eco-feminist journals, related books, major conferences, workshops, and university curricula that helped to further stimulate excitement about eco-feminism. During this time, some left-oriented feminists noticed a problematic tendency within the movement, its vague relationship to anarchist or leftist politics. The eco-feminism introduced by King at the ISE was linked to a vision of a non-hierarchical, ecological society free of status and capitalist social relations. Note. In 1987, I coined the term social ecofeminism to clarify a specifically leftist trajectory within a steadily differentiating ecofeminist milieu. That year, the term was embraced by the left green network that included social ecofeminism as one of its ten key values. In 1989, the youth greens embraced a social ecofeminism as well within these green forums and at the ISE the term referred to an approach to ecofeminism informed by social anarchism and social ecology, it reflected an attempt to combine an historical understanding of questions of nature and gender with a reconstructive and utopian vision of a post-capitalist, post-status society. End note. The Women's Unity Statement of the WPAs reflected this sentiment by challenging the power of the state and capital through its defamation of the Pentagon, the U.S. government, and multinational corporations. From a social ecofeminist perspective, an ecofeminist perspective informed by social ecology and social anarchism, the writings that filled the pages of the first two major anthologies on ecofeminism were disappointing indeed. Of the 26 chapters of the anthology Healing the Wounds, published in 1989, there were only two authors, Vandana Shiva and Anistra King, who mentioned the words capitalism or the state. Instead, writers pointed to the causes of ecological destruction by appealing to terms such as technology, patriarchal rationality, economic motivation and industrialization. For instance, in her introduction to the anthology Judith Plant describes the causes of ecological destruction to be the result of a man's world. Quote, the world is rapidly being penetrated, consumed and destroyed by this man's world, spreading across the face of the earth teasing and tempting the last remnants of loving peoples with its modern glass beads, televisions and tanks, filling the ears of poor peoples with doublespeak about security, only to establish dangerous technology on their homelands, voraciously trying to control all that is natural regarding nature as a natural resource to be exploited for the gain of a few. End quote. Note. Judith Plant, Introduction, In Healing the Wounds, The Promise of Ecofeminism, Ed. Judith Plant, Philadelphia, New Society Publishers, 1989, pages 1 to 7. End note. In this passage, Plant points to the effects of, and social relations within, a market economy by discussing the exploitative gain of the few. Yet Plant fails to mediate her discussion of the causes of ecological problems with categories of race, class, or with an understanding of institutional forms of capitalist and state power. Instead, she invokes universal notions such as this man's world, retained from radical feminist theory, that did not help to clarify her political position. During this time, 
some social eco-feminists, along with other eco-feminists, also began to notice a minor, but notable romantic tendency within several eco-feminist writings that made the theory a target for unending, and often unfair, criticisms of essentialism. Note. Many of the essays within Reweaving the World were originally presented as papers at the eco-feminist perspectives, culture, nature, theory conference held at the University of Southern California in 1987. End note. The second major eco-feminist anthology Reweaving the World, containing essays written in the late 1980s, was punctuated with several unproblematized essentialisms regarding nature and culture. Note. In the early 1990s, there emerged a body of critical writings about the relationship between ecofeminism and questions of spiritualism, essentialism, and hegemony surrounding third world development. Sinistra King, Ecofeminism, The Necessity of History and Mystery, in King, What is Ecofeminism, New York, Ecofeminist Resources, 1990. Also, for a more controversial discussion, see Janet Beale. Rethinking Ecofeminist Politics, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1991, and Catriona Sandilin's Ecofeminism and Its Discontents, Notes Toward a Politics of Diversity in Trumpeter, 8,2 Spring 1991. See also Cecile Jackson, Women Slash Nature or Gender Slash History. A Critique of Ecofeminist Development, in the Journal of Peasant Studies, Volume 20, Number 3. April 1993, pages 389 to 419. Chris J. Cuomo also offers an interesting discussion of anti essential criticism in feminism and ecological communities, London, Routledge, 1998. End note. For example, in her essay Ecofeminism, Our Roots and Flowering, Charlene Spritnik described the elemental power of the female appealing to an essentialist notion of gender. Note. Charlene Spritnik, Ecofeminism, Our Roots and Flowering, in Reweaving the World, The Emergence of Ecofeminism, eds Irene Diamond and Gloria Fernan Orenstein, San Francisco, Sierra Club Books, 1990, p6. End note. In turn, while reflecting upon the day on which she introduced her newborn daughter to the world of nature by bringing her into the backyard of a Los Angeles hospital, Spritnik conflates this act with that of ritual practiced by Omaha Indians. Quote, I introduced her to the pine trees and the plants and the flowers, and they to her, and finally to the pearly moon wrapped in a soft haze and to the stars. I, knowing nothing then of nature-based religious ritual or eco-feminist theory, had felt an impulse for my wondrous little child to meet the rest of cosmic society, that experience was so disconnected from life in a modern, technocratic society. That, last year when I heard about a ritual of Omaha Indians in which the infant is presented to the cosmos, I waxed enthusiastic, but forgot completely that I, too, had once been there, so effective is our cultural denial of nature. Emphasis added, end quote. Note. Ebedum, P10. End note. Spritnik's text demonstrated the problem that surfaced as some ecofeminists asserted universal notions of nature, ritual, and cultural practice. As a middle-class white woman of Christian heritage, Spritnik described giving birth to a child in a hospital in an industrialized capitalist society in the U.S. The trees and plants on the hospital grounds to which she introduced her child, represented a nature that had been carefully crafted to convey culturally specific understandings of what kinds of plants, grass, flowers, and view should represent nature within the setting of post-industrial Los Angeles. Yet, despite the multiple layerings of time, place, and culture that produced the hospital and its grounds, Spritnik described her surroundings as part of a universal and essential there of the Omaha Indians, to which she, too, once belonged. I mention this example not to single out Spritnik, nor to construct an essentialist straw ecofeminist, but to point to a tendency that emerged as ecofeminist theory was integrated with particular strands of feminist spirituality during the late 1980s. Trying to reach for the ecological in a well-meaning and spiritual way, several theorists failed to sufficiently problematize categories of woman, nature, and culture. <laughs>
and, while the early 1990s brought eloquent anti-essentialist critiques by theorists such as Val Plumwood and Karen Warren a popularized version of eco-feminist spirituality endured. Both within the anti-feminist imaginary of those that wage what Greta Gard refers to as eco-feminist backlash, and within real instances of essentialist eco-feminism outside of the academy essentialist eco-feminism still flourishes today. Note. See Greta Gard. Misunderstanding Ecofeminism, Z Magazine 3, 1, 1994-22 End note Although the 1990s have not brought a revival of an autonomous ecofeminist movement in the US, the decade has given rise to a promising new wave of ecofeminist activism and scholarship. Ecofeminist critiques of deep ecology initiated in the late 1980s raised awareness of sexism within such organizations as Earth First and within forest defense work, signaling increased participation by ecofeminists within such movements. In turn, ecofeminists such as Greta Gard and Marty Keel, engaged in animal rights activism, broadened the discussion to include crucial insights into the social and cultural contexts surrounding issues such as vegetarianism and hunting. Note. For a look at ecofeminists' discussions of animal liberation that appeared in the early 1990s, see Greta Gard's anthology Ecofeminism, Women, Animals, Nature, Philadelphia, Temple University Press, 1993. End note. Within feminist philosophy ecofeminists such as Val Plumwood and Karen Warren made significant strides in addressing and transcending problems of essentialism within the theory. And quite recently there have emerged thoughtful and critical discussions of ecofeminist history by ecofeminists such as Greta Gard, Noelle Sturgeon, and Chris Cuomo, ushering in a new era of self-reflexivity by activists and scholars within the movement itself. Note. See Greta Gard, Ecological Politics, Ecofeminists and the Greens, Philadelphia, Temple University Press, 1988, Noelle Sturgeon, Ecofeminist Natures, Race, Gender, Feminist Theory and Political Action, London, Routledge, 1987, and Chris Cuomo, Feminism and Ecological Communities, An Ethic of Flourishing, London, Routledge, 1998. End note. While not all of this activity emerged directly out of ecofeminism's originating tendencies, the contributions of the women involved in ecofeminism's early years are still very much felt today. The desire for nature within radical feminism, social ecology environmental justice, and international environmental politics gave rise to an ecofeminism that still expresses an embodied and non-hierarchical approach to the desire for nature that goes beyond individualistic and romantic tendencies within the wider ecology movement. Overall, ecofeminism has consistently offered a politicized and collective expression of a social, rather than individual, desire for political and ecological integrity. Striving to make connections between women's everyday lives and ecological degradation within the context of hierarchy and oppression, ecofeminism has continued to push the radical ecology movement forward by raising awareness of the ongoing need to examine issues of gender, culture, race, class, and power. As we look toward the next decade, we may begin to consider how to continue to elaborate upon ecofeminist theory and action by building upon and transcending the possibilities and problems presented by its origins. By integrating new areas of ecofeminist scholarship with the best of what its originating traditions have to offer, we may begin to explore the potentialities for creating an increasingly social desire for nature that can take us passionately and thoughtfully into the next century.